Hello everyone and welcome back to the course Introduction to Data Science. In this video we will talk about patterns in data. How do we find patterns in a data set and how can we determine which points do not follow a certain pattern. So assume that we have a data set with n observations. And for the moment we work with a one-dimensional data set. But of course what we do here can be extended to multiple dimensions. Why do we need to find structure? Because if we can find structure in the data, we can summarize the data sets and we can better, it's easier to understand the data set. Especially when you have a data set with, for example, thousands or 10,000, 100,000 observations, having a structure in the data will make it much easier to understand what is happening in the data. For example, assume that we have a data set with, say, 1,000 observations and assume that we find that that data set is actually very similar to a, say, normal distribution. We call that a normal distribution is a distribution that has this shape. And to understand a normal distribution, we only need a mean, say we call that mu, and a standard deviation, sigma. So if we have a data set with 1000 observations, but we can, um, we can uh, summarize it with a normal distribution, we can use only two parameters, a mu and a sigma, that captures the whole data set. Let me show you how you can do this in R. So we are going to create a data set with normal distributions, and in this case we take 500 observations. So the vector data, that is our data set, it has 500 observations that are simulated from a normal distribution. I use the function r norm, that is a function that I can use in R to generate 500 realizations of a normal distribution. If I only um, use as input 500, so I do not say to R what is the mean, what is the standard deviation, then R will by default take a mean 0, a standard deviation 1. What I then do is I will create a histogram using the function hist. So I use the function hist to make the histogram. I say make a histogram of the vector, the data set data, where I take 50 different bins. You can change that number to see what gives you the nice, the best results. I can make a histogram of a density or with frequencies. In this case, I take density, so I say frequency is false. And here I put the title for my histogram. So then I can create a histogram and I put on top of that histogram, I put the density function of a standard normal distribution. So standard normal means a normal distribution with mean zero, standard deviation one. So I'm going to add a line to the histogram. With the sequence function, I make the x values. So I go from minus four until four with a step size 0 0.1. The function d norm, gives me the density of a normal distribution. And I calculate the density, of course, in my values that I use for the x-axis. And then if you run the code of the previous slide, you get a plot that looks like one of these four plots. So what I did here to make these four plots, I repeated the procedure of the previous slide, but each time I used a different data set. So instead of only making a data set of five or normal distributions, I use different distributions, a different number of um, observations in my data set, and so on, to see a difference. For example, in this first plot, you see that the histogram and the density are almost identical. So here, the data is following very, very closely a normal distribution. Most likely, the data is really normally distributed. Same here, you see that the data and the uh, histogram are very closely linked to each other. So in the top plots, it looks like the data is indeed normally distributed. For this third plot, it's not so clear. The normal distribution seems to give a good approximation of your data, but it's not exactly the same. In this four plot, you really see that the data is not following a normal distribution. 
So especially this third plot is, I think, the most important. In the first two plots, it's almost too nice to be true. You will rarely find a data set that follows a normal distribution or any other distribution that closely. In the fourth plot, you cannot use a normal distribution. It's a bad approximation. In this third plot, it's a little bit in between. Maybe we can say the data is not normally distributed, but on the other hand, by using the normal distribution, we can explain a lot of variation of the data. Maybe not everything, but we can explain a lot. And again, maybe you have a data set with many observations, a normal distribution. You only need two parameters, a mu and a sigma. So if you can explain, say, 90% of your data with a normal distribution, then maybe that is easier, more convenient to do so, because you don't need to use that whole complex data set, you can just use a normal distribution with a mu and a given sigma. So if we find that our data set is very closely following a normal distribution, maybe it's not really normally distributed, but the normal distribution to us seems to be a good approximation, then that gives us structure on the data. Then we know a bit how the data should behave. And once we know the structure of the data, we can try to, try to detect what we call extreme points. Observations that do not follow the pattern that the majority of the data is following. If we say that a normal distribution like this is a quite good description of the data, and of course, if you find observations that are all the way here or here, these are extreme points. According to our structure, our normal distribution, it's very unlikely to find these observations. So either you find an extreme point in the sense it's extremely large, or here it's extremely small. And in the data pre-processing, you have to identify such extreme points. Because we want to understand where are the extreme points and how do they influence our data sets. The next step is then to find a strategy on how to handle extreme points. And here it's, it's a little bit a, um, a difficult question because it's not the case that extreme points are always observations that are wrong. Sometimes extreme points happen. Think about um, stock price data that can contain extreme points because maybe the market crashed that day extremely negative returns. However, maybe you are, with your data science study, you are interested in these extreme events. And in that case, you have to be very careful what you do with these extreme points. If you delete all the extreme negative returns, then of course your data science project will never be able to predict a stock market crash. Because if it's not in the data, you cannot predict it. So we have to first identify the extreme points, but then we have to think how important are these extreme points for our data science project. We can use the histogram, but also a box plot to identify extreme points. So have a look at the histogram first. We see that there is a clear shape in this distribution, right? Most of the data is following this red line. But you have here this observation that seems to be very off from the rest of the data. That is an extreme point. Again, it does not mean that observation is wrong. Maybe it really happened. Maybe it's a very important observation. Maybe we can learn a lot from that single observation. But at least we know by now it's an extreme observation. You have the rest of the data having some structure. And then you have this single point that is very different, is a different story compared to the rest of the data. Another way to identify extreme points is the box plot, where we have the box here. The box contains the majority of the data. It's most likely that you find observations in the box. Then you have these whiskers here, where we know that, well, sometimes things are larger or smaller than we expect. So we have to allow observations to be in this or in this region. But you see that you have this observation here, which is far away from the box and the whiskers. It's a very extreme observation. So box plots and histograms are very important and efficient tools to detect 
um, extreme observations in a one-dimensional setting. So if we have one variable and we have to say, well, are there extreme observations for this variable? What can we do in more dimensions? Assume that we have x and y, we have two variables. How can we find extreme observations? Of course, we can go one by one. We can find observations that are extreme observations for x, and then we can do the same for y. So apply what we did on the previous slide, but just two times for x and for y. But we will show in the next example that that's only one part of the story. If you have x and y, we can have observations that are extreme, but we cannot detect them by only looking at x or only looking at y. We have to combine x and y to detect the extreme observations. So assume in this example that we have x and y. We have data for x, we have data for y. We are first going to find extreme observations for x, and then we are going to determine extreme observations for y. So for x, we do the same as we did before. We make an histogram, we make a box plot, and as you can see, it seems all fine. We cannot find any observations in x that are very different from all the rest. They seem to follow the pattern together with all the rest of the data. And the same holds for y. If we only look at the histogram of y or in the box plot of y, we don't see any extreme observations here. However, if we look at a scatter plot, so we put the values of x and the values of y in one plot, then you see that the structure of the data is this linear model. However, you have one observation, this guy here, that is away from all the rest of the data. So it is an extreme observation, but it's not extreme because it's very large in the x direction or very small in the x direction. It's also not very large or small in the y direction. It's an extreme observation because it does not follow the pattern that x and y are together following. 